Okay, so a video like this has some potential to be quite contentious. Let me say at the start that this is all my opinion, and I'm going to try and justify my conclusions as best as I can, but we are talking about two different fantasy worlds with very different contexts. There's going to be some ambiguity that we just have to deal with. It's not going to be a perfect comparison. You can fight me about that in the comments. Warcraft vs Warhammer. It's the kind of thing that seems like it would have been more relevant in the early 2000s when Warcraft Star was in its firm ascendancy and Blizzard Entertainment could do nothing wrong. Looking from the perspective of 2023, with Games Workshop turning out many new games, and now with the potential for TV and maybe even movie deals, it seems like a shadow has fallen over Blizzard and the once ubiquitous Warcraft. Despite my intense passion for Warhammer, I have to admit that Warcraft 3 will always have a soft spot in my heart. It's familiar, comforting, even to think about a time when RTS games were super popular and I really wanted to know where the Warcraft story was going. The X vs Y format is nothing new on YouTube. Nerds have been debating about who would win on internet forums since basically their very existence. But this video is mostly inspired by the sci-fi comparisons of the Eckhart's Ladder YouTube channel. As such, I want to lay out a bunch of terms for the comparison before I actually get into it. Okay, so first up is the matter of scope. There is a lot of Warcraft and a lot of Warhammer, so trying to cover everything would be like trying to comprehend infinity. For this video, I'm primarily going to focus on the Alliance, as depicted in the RTS game Warcraft 3. I've never played World of Warcraft, I have no interest in MMORPGs, and it's not really about armies or nations, it's about player journeys and characters. So I'll primarily look at the Alliance, as they are depicted in that game, in terms of their military, operational history, and I'll try to refer to some events from Warcraft 1 and Warcraft 2 where necessary. More specifically, I'm going to focus on the Alliance as represented by the Kingdom of Lordaeron from Warcraft 3. The reason for this is because it's the most powerful of the human kingdoms before its destruction, and as a result, it's the most pertinent, I think, for this comparison. Similarly, I'll be excluding the end times for Warhammer Fantasy because, well, I don't like it, and also I think it doesn't give us a representative look at what the Empire can be and can do. So basically, I'll be mostly looking at Warhammer Fantasy's 8th edition army book for the Empire, uh, along with a general background of Warhammer Fantasy's timeline, where I think it might be necessary. Now you might be wondering, comparing all the lore of perhaps a single game, or maybe three games, against the entirety of Warhammer might be a bit unfair, and you're right. It's not exactly as though I can compare like versus like in this case. We can look at a general perception of Lordaeron and how well it fares, as it's the most powerful kingdom in the Alliance in Warcraft, and also we can look at the Empire as one of the most powerful human nations uh, in Warhammer Fantasy, and we can sort of take a look at how these two might compare against each other. Uh, with that in mind, the next question is, how do we assess these two disparate nations? I understand that there is inherently a problem with power scaling between different settings. If you've seen any of Eckhart Lauder's videos that include Warhammer 40k, you'll know that Warhammer as a setting can sometimes be incredibly overzealous in turning up the dial of power. Warhammer Fantasy is, in my opinion, a lot more grounded and balanced than Warhammer 40k, but still, it's not exactly the same. So, to that end, I've decided on several criteria that I'm going to be using for the comparison. One side will either get an advantage, or maybe both sides will end up roughly equal. From this, I'll draw out who I think would be stronger and why. So, the categories are as follows. Army organization, structure, diplomatic potential and cooperation, magic, technology, and military history. Of course, the other part is assessing the different contexts. It's not realistic, but I will try to consider three different scenarios. Uh, the first is where the Alliance has to invade the Empire, the second is where the Empire has to invade Lordaeron, and the third is where two representative armies of each nation have to fight a field battle against each other. Considering these contexts, I think I will ultimately be able to decide who would get to win between these two nations.
Okay, so starting with the army organization and structure. Uh, so with Warcraft, it's really difficult to get a sense of the size of the Alliance military. In a typical game, you have a supply limit, usually between something like uh, 60 to 100. Um, I think it's mostly 80 in most cases. In a typical game, that supply limit will prevent you from building your units indefinitely. So you can only build a limited number of units worth of supply. So a large army might be a dozen or more units, depending on how you want to slice it. Obviously, the more powerful units that you have, the fewer of them you will have. Uh, but generally, you know, they can do more. Uh, we also don't get exact sizes from Blizzard exactly about how big things are, only a sort of relative sense. Uh, I saw one post from alternativehistory.com, which provides one suggestion for a population of 18 million people for Lordaeron. And the poster arrived at this conclusion by roughly assuming that the population of Lordaeron is comparable to the Holy Roman Empire. So by that metric, by assuming that Lordaeron is similar to the Holy Roman Empire, the actual empire, which is directly based on the Holy Roman Empire, would also have maybe a similar population. Uh, although, again, the numbers don't necessarily line up on the Warhammer side as well. Um, I think trying to do a numbers comparison is a bit of a fool's errand, as fantasy writers are not necessarily demographers, and they're not really likely to spend all that much time thinking about the demographics of their setting, beyond what would be required for the story. So if the Empire or Lordaeron suffers a huge loss, that's all they really need to say in the context of the story. It doesn't really matter what the numbers are. It doesn't matter if they lose 1,000 citizens or 2,000 citizens. What matters is that they say, hey, this has been a big loss for us. So rather than lose my mind trying to come up with definitive numbers, uh, I think I'll rather look at the way that the armies are structured and composed, and that I think will give us a better idea of what the militaries are actually capable of. So the basic components of a Lordaeron army are heavily armored footmen with swords and shields, dwarven riflemen, elven priests, and heavily armored knights. Supplementing these forces, we have everything from elves on dragonhawks, sorceresses, dwarven and gnomish war machines, and of course, heroes like paladins. Several things stand out about this roster to me. Firstly, the high prevalence of armor. Both the footman and knight are wearing full plate armor, which is considered to be quite protective, but of course, expensive and rare in our own real world. Warcraft has cartoony proportions, of course, but it still stands to reason that the most basic Alliance melee troops have really good protection, although I do wish the knights would be wearing helmets. The Alliance incorporates a wide diversity of units with many different capabilities. There are aerial units like Dragonhawk Riders and Flying Machines, siege units and mortar teams for attacking buildings, and a wide variety of supporting spellcasters to buff, heal the army, and debuff enemies. A properly coordinated Alliance army can be quite durable with a very strong line of durable knights and gunpowder troops and magic. We never really see the Alliance muster forces of any real large numbers, however. Even the purging of an entire city, something like Stratholm, merely requires the death of a hundred civilians. Armies in Warcraft are meant to be larger, clearly, obviously that's what we're talking about, but the design of the game lends itself to a much smaller and more personal confrontation. Warhammer Fantasy, by contrast, is all about mass battles, and anyone fielding an Empire army can really tell you how large the armies can actually get. At its core, an Imperial army will consist primarily of state troops of various types. Halberds, spears, swords, handguns, crossbows, and bows. These are all the weapons of the state troopers of the Empire. As the Old World's only professional army, these soldiers make up the bulk of Imperial armies, and are armed with a wide variety of weapons to face a wide variety of dangers and threats. Like the Alliance, many types of supplemental forces are usually joined to an Imperial army to help bolster its forces. Free companies of mercenaries can be enticed to battle with coin, as well as bands of roving religious zealots called flagellants. The Empire has a powerful cavalry tradition too, from the very heavily armored knightly orders to the flamboyant pistoliers and outriders with their black powder firearms. The Empire can further supplement their forces with very limited numbers of magical beasts, spellcasters, priests, artillery, and even magical war machines, like the Celestial Hurricanum. Both forces are in many ways quite similar, but I think the advantage lies in the Empire for a few reasons. Firstly, the Empire is much more of a coordinated force than the Alliance. For the most part, Alliance soldiers rely on fairly basic tactics, like forming shield walls with the defendability from footmen. By contrast, Empire soldiers are trained to operate in very close conjunction with each other, and we see those things represented in their game system. For example, the Imperial Detachment System, 
With the detachment system, units can provide covering fire, supporting charges, and so on to other nearby units, giving you a greater sense that the Empire Army is much more designed and much more capable of operating with more sophisticated tactics. Their units are also a lot more flexible. A footman only has a sword and a shield. The basic Empire Trooper can be armed with a wide variety of weapons that can fulfill different roles and functions depending on the nature of their foe. If they're fighting heavily armed or tough soldiers, they can bring halberds. If they need mass ranks, they can have spearmen. If they need particular duelists, or if they're dealing with very particular kinds of foes, they can bring their more skilled swordsmen. The cavalry is also a lot more diverse beyond just charging home with lances. Yes, they do have that, and I would argue that both are great examples of heavily armed cavalry, but the Empire has pistoliers, outriders, and various other types of cavalry that provide much more than just melee power in close combat. As a total military, the Empire Army is just more flexible than the Alliance Army, and for that reason, I think the Empire gets the advantage here. At first glance, it might seem that the Alliance is better diplomatically than the Empire. After all, it is called the Alliance. As we saw in the previous section, Alliance armies are typically made up of a coalition of humans, elves, dwarves, and even gnomes, who all provide units and resources that suit their people's strength, be it might or magic. However, Warcraft 3 shows us how contentious and ten tenuous these diplomatic ties can be. For example, in the wake of the Scourge invasion of Lodoran, the surviving human leadership essentially imposes xenophobic, pro-human sentiments on the remaining Alliance forces. The result of this is the withdrawal of support from the Dwarven contingents and the complete banishment of elves from the Lodoran army. The Kingdom of Lodoran falls, and the other kingdoms aren't exactly in a rush to help it stave off complete destruction. When things are fine, the elements of the Alliance work as intended, but when there's a major shock, such as the invasion of the Scourge, well, the wheels fall off the wagon. The fall of Silvermoon, the homeland of the High Elves, for example, is a great case. Despite the High Elves being an important part of the Alliance, their homeland falls to the invasion of Arthurus and the Scourge with nary the intervention of outside forces. Thereafter, the Elves become a dispossessed people who have to join in with a demon Illidan for security. Of course, that's not to say that the Empire is necessarily better. The history of the Empire is riven with civil wars and internal strife that's brought upon purely by the structure of the Empire's political system. Warhammer is a setting in which any faction can fight any other faction, and there are plenty of cases of conflict between the Empire and the High Elves or the Dwarves, for example, in Warhammer's history. However, when we zoom out and we take a look at the Empire as a whole, we see that despite whenever disagreements may, uh, may arise, the Warhammer Fantasy's Dwarves do come to the aid of the Empire when things are direst. During many of the Chaos Invasions, particularly the Chaos Invasion of Azavar Kul, many Dwarves fought on the side of the Empire and their allies to defend the Old World. Similarly, the High Elves also mobilized large contingents to support the human endeavors. So diplomacy is possible and it does happen. It's just that each nation tends to see itself and its own internal problems first. By the time Elves, Dwarves, and humans are all fighting along each other, it's usually because there's an existential threat to the future of their world. The most casual cooperation that you might see, for example, are Imperial Dwarfs in the army, or maybe the hiring of elven mercenaries. It won't be anything as close to the cooperation that a well-functioning alliance army will typically have. The reality of the matter is this. The Empire has diplomatic ties with other nations, but these ties are generally only called upon in the most dire circumstances. The Empire has a difficult enough time fostering cooperation between its own competing provinces than it does trying to generally rely upon diplomatic ties to its neighbor, like, say for example, Bretonia, or perhaps even Kislev. These nations are expected to look after their own borders and their own affairs, and if some mad hatter with a flaming crown sweeps down from the north, well, then everyone is expected to stand together. But even then, you know, the empire is a bulwark for most of the rest of the people of the old world, after Kislev, of course. One final factor is the internal politics of the empire. Lodoran is the most powerful kingdom before its fall, but it's relatively united. The empire is a collection of provinces and states that are tied together by an emperor and, in theory, a collective political system, but the reality of the matter is, that can be tenuous at best. There have been plenty of times when the unity of the empire has been fractured and the provinces fought each other. Furthermore, not every province responds to every problem of every other province. It doesn't really matter to somebody, say for example, in Wissenland, if Nordland is being invaded by Chaos Raiders. 
it, they might be convinced to send troops if, for example, the emperor orders them to, but generally speaking, each of the provinces must itself look to its own internal defense before looking maybe to some larger political structure to send help. So I think this is something of a tied area. Lordaeron does have better cooperation, especially with other nations, but it fell apart really easily, and it wasn't able to be revived after it had fell. Whereas the Empire can generally get along with its neighbors, but it only relies upon them when facing existential threats. That it is able to survive all of these existential threats and pull itself together despite its numerous problems, I think does speak to its credit, even if I do believe that there could stand to be more cooperation outside of the Empire with its neighbors and so on and so forth. I think the magic section is probably going to be the most contentious. I have a feeling about that. Magic is very different in these two settings. In Warhammer, magic is rare and extremely dangerous. Failure to properly manage your magical power results in your head exploding at best, and at worst, your body becomes a portal for demons to invade. By contrast, magic in Warcraft is extremely commonplace, and generally speaking, quite safe. The priests, for example, don't have to worry about their heads exploding if they're trying to cast a heal spell. The Alliance frequently includes a wide variety of battle mages and sorcerers amongst its ranks in order to bolster their own troops or disrupt or harm the enemy. Magic can be dangerous, yes, but it's not necessarily inherently dangerous in the same way that magic is dangerous in Warhammer Fantasy. But just because magic is more prevalent doesn't necessarily mean that magic is inherently more useful. If we look at the magical units that make up the Alliance, they primarily occupy a support role to the other soldiers. Even the most magical of factions, the city of Dalaran, still had to comprise the bulk of its forces with conventional soldiers. The use of magic is important, yes, you can use it to do many different things, casting spells that can slow the enemy, heal your own troops, and so on and so forth, but it's not so powerful that you can comprise an entire army of spellcasters who, of course, would be able to stand up to the enemy's own units. Does that mean that the Empire's majors are inherently outclassed, simply because magic is more prevalent in Warcraft? I'm not so sure. Imperial battle mages and the Empire's own warrior priests are both very experienced in terms of their combat use and also inter their integration with the wider Imperial army. Like mages in the Alliance, they are also used to support operations with conventional militaries, and they are also used to dealing with a wide variety of magical threats, primarily from the forces of chaos. An Imperial army is never going to have as many mages or sorcerers as a Alliance one, but the ones that they do have do have a proven record of their abilities so I wouldn't count them out just yet. Like in Warcraft, magic and Warhammer can be used to achieve tremendous things, but only by tremendously powerful individuals, which of course both settings do have. So my conclusion is that the Alliance would have the advantage in this capacity. They do have simply more mages that they can throw at the problem. I will however assume that when one faction invades the other, that something of the rules of that magic system applies when the faction comes in. So for example, when the Empire mages invade Lordaeron, they are no longer subject to the problems of chaos, which I think would make them stronger. But when Lordaeron invades the Empire, they might have to deal with chaos interfering with their magic, which might make them weaker. It's not necessarily going to be a completely decisive factor. Obviously, I don't want to speculate about how, for example, maybe Lordaeron mages might be better at handling chaos because of the nature of their magic, you know, and vice versa, but it is something to consider, I think. As any student of history can tell you, technology can be extremely decisive when it comes to military matters. In this regard, it might seem that the Alliance has the clear advantage over the Empire, but it's more complicated than that. Both factions have access to gunpowder weapons, but the Alliance makes more prolific use of them in ways that the Empire cannot. Dwarven riflemen are a mainline part of the Lordaeron army, and they also field Dwarven mortar teams, which provide them with better access to mobile artillery. The Empire also has handgunners in their army, but their artillery is more fixed, taking the form of field guns, mortars, and things like the Hellblaster Volley Cannon. I would say that the Dwarven Riflemen are better than Empire handgunners, if only because Dwarven Thunderers in Warhammer Fantasy are also better than Empire handgunners, and maybe we can draw an obvious parallel there, that if the Empire relied on Dwarves for their firearms, perhaps they would have better firearms, but they don't. But, of course, we don't see the use of large-scale field pieces in the Lordaeron army uh, that we do in the Empire army, for example. For sieges and battles, having more artillery than the other side is important, 
but it's not necessarily everything. The mortars are useful, yes, but they're not as powerful as actual field cannons. While both settings have gunpowder weapons, they also share a trait whereby gunpowder weapons are not necessarily predominant. Armies with less advanced ranged weapons, like bows, crossbows, even thrown weapons like spears or axes, frequently fight on par with firearms. Reminder, of course, that the baseline comparison unit in the Horde, for example to the Alliance, is a guy throwing spears. However, the real difference is in their access to war machines. The Empire is outclassed here by, I think, a significant margin. The Alliance has access to flying machines and non-rare steam tanks. Yes, their steam tanks are short-ranged, but unlike the Empire, they can easily build more of them, and they've got none of the reliability issues that plague Imperial steam tanks. I should know, I've tried to use steam tanks several times on the tabletop, and I've had less than stellar success each time. By virtue of their collaboration with gnomes and dwarves, the Alliance has access to war machines and vehicles that outclass what the Empire can bring to a battle. If only because the Empire has to, for the most part, develop this technology on their own. It's tricky to decide if the Imperial Steam Tank is comparable to the Alliance Siege Engine, but I think it's undeniable that the Alliance can feel many more of them, and much more easily. So even if the Steam Tank was superior, it doesn't matter, because there are only 12 of them in the Empire, no matter what your Total War Warhammer uh, playthrough says. Even if the steam tank, you know, was superior, it doesn't matter because for every one steam tank, the Alliance can field many more siege engines. And they definitely would be able to outfight, say for example, a steam tank if there were 12 of the things for every one. The Alliance also has access to things like the Gyrocopter and the Elven Dragonhawk Riders. This gives them a distinct advantage and decisive advantage, I would argue, over the Empire, which also has access to flying units, like for example Pegasus Riders and even a dragon if you bother to put Carl Franz on one. But the problem is not necessarily that the Empire lacks these things, but they are far less prevalent. An Empire army might only have a single man on a Pegasus or a Griffin, whereas the Alliance army can have a contingent of Dragonhawk riders, backed by Gyrocopters and Dwarf Griffin riders for support. So I'm definitely going to give the advantage to the Alliance here. The shadow that looms over the Alliance is, of course, the invasion of the Scourge. Previously, the Alliance had managed to weather Orc invasions relatively intact, even going so far as to counterattack the Orcish homeland in Warcraft 1 and 2, respectively. However, the Scourge basically brought Lodoran and the Alliance to its knees. The Crown Prince becomes the leader of the undead, who then murders the actual king, throwing the entire realm into chaos, and of course, naturally, it swiftly and irreparably succumbs to the undead. Lordaeron doesn't recover at any point in Warcraft 3 and its expansion, and instead it becomes the domain of another undead faction called the Forsaken. Granted, the kingdom does have many survivors, like for example groups like the Scarlet Crusade, but it never actually properly recovers. Contrast that with the Empire, which has endured very many invasions by the undead. The Vampire Wars, which lasted over 100 years, were still not enough to actually bring the Empire down. Granted, the Warhammer vampires have never created an undeath plague, like the Scourge, but they are a persistent and serious threat to the Empire, not to mention all the other invasions that have battered but never broken it. Chaos, Skaven, Orcs, Beastmen, they've all tried to destroy the Empire, and they're all thrown back each time. Yes, there are losses, but the Empire is never so destroyed that it can't recover. However, you know, we have to argue here that the Empire has never really known any kind of peace either. There is always something that potentially threatens its borders and its people. Its armies are a lot more battle-hardened and experienced than I think the Alliance would be. The Empire has a proven record of surviving existential threats that would probably, I think, have been too much for Lordaeron to handle. So, I'm giving the advantage here to the Empire. Okay, so the final assessment. Well, I think the Empire has the advantage in its army structure, composition, and its military history whereas I think the Alliance has the advantage in military, magic, and technology. So I think that the Alliance would struggle to invade the Empire. In a conventional assault, they'd have to assault fortresses like Helmgart or the Blackfire Keep, and these have historically managed to keep out some, some of the very best armies that the setting has to offer. Not to mention that trying to invade the Empire also risks having to deal with many of the other foes that might be trying to do the same. You can imagine how funny it might be, perhaps, that as the Lodorod army is going to invade the Empire, they have to first deal with the Chaos army that's also trying to invade the Empire. Uh, the Warhammer setting is just dangerous like that. 
I think the only way that the Alliance could successfully invade the Empire is if they used magic to open portals in key strategic locations, and then performed a series of rapid attacks to throw the Imperial structure into chaos. Whether this would work is something that remains to be seen, as the Empire does have its own levels of magical defenses. When you attack the Empire, you run the risk of mobilizing all of the provinces against you, which I think would be a pretty large military force. So, for scenario 1, I think the Alliance would win in 4 out of every 10 times. By contrast, I also think that the Empire would have a very difficult time invading the Kingdom of Lordaeron. In order to attack the Kingdom, they also have to go through a neighboring Kingdom, or possibly do a naval invasion. The problem is that the Alliance has technological superiority, and this includes their navy, so I doubt the Imperial Navy, which is generally not the best navy in its own setting, would be able to contest with the Alliance Navy. Furthermore, trying to get the majority of the Empire into the invasion I think would also be difficult, if not impossible. The Empire can much more easily mobilize for a defensive war, but an offensive war is much harder to justify to the people. I also doubt that the Empire would be able to use portals in the same way as the Alliance could. Magic is just not as prolific in the Empire, and while they have powerful mages, the mass use of portals for assaults is something much more associated with demons in this setting than humans. A trait which of course is shared by both settings, by the way. So, in this case, I would say that the Empire would probably win this scenario maybe 2 or 3 times out of 10. Finally, we have the field battle. I think, generally speaking, both sides would have a difficult time invading the other, so maybe if we really want to assess this, we need to think about, for example, the two sides trying to fight a field battle. They both manage to rally up their armies, they both have generals of maybe comparable skill or ability, and now we have to fight some kind of battle. So, presuming more or less that we have some kind of equal strength, uh, maybe not necessarily equal numbers, I think that the Empire would win field battles against the Alliance maybe 6 out of every 10 times. Despite their technological and magical prowess, uh, the Empire has a highly diverse and flexible fighting force that is also extremely battle-hardened. Many times the Empire has triumphed against armies that make use of much more magic and also technology that outclasses them. Both sides have roughly comparable levels of some amounts of technology, like for example gunpowder, but you know, of course, the Alliance does have some advantages in terms of its war machines. But we're talking about field battles, right? Uh, a siege engine is primarily useful in destroying buildings. So it's not exactly the best unit for destroying other units. So I think when it comes down to who wins the field battle, it's about which army has the better military system. And not only do I think that, generally speaking, the Empire would probably beat an Alliance army in, in, a, in a field battle, I also think that they would win more often in terms of having to fight repeated battles. We can imagine that if we had to pick several Imperial armies and put them against several Alliance armies, I imagine that several of the Imperial armies would be able to easily outclass many Alliance armies, and that would just be a factor of their level of experience and their level of battle-heartedness. You know, there's a reason why the Empire spent almost 3,000 years as a political entity in one of the most dangerous settings ever put to fiction. Okay, so in the end, I think the Empire beats the Alliance, but it's much closer than I originally believed, especially as somebody with a strong Empire bias. After all, I have an Empire army. Several Empire armies, really. <laughs> but I do think the Alliance is a great faction, though, and I'm always a big fan of theirs. I just don't think they'd be able to beat the Empire, at least not predominantly. Uh, perhaps maybe you'd have one or two examples where they would be able to win, but I don't necessarily think they could comprehensively beat them. I hope this was interesting, and remember to like and subscribe and all of that good stuff. The channel is, of course, gaining subscribers, and I'm very thankful for everyone that does decide to subscribe. Uh, I hope that you have enjoyed this content. Uh, I am interested in making more Warcraft content, and if you'd like to request something, then by all means do so in the comments below. I hope you have a lovely day, and goodbye.